to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Colin, this week I am super excited to bring you an incredibly rare and unique individual in that this person has accomplished the Olmsted Scholar Program. Mm -hmm. There are not a whole lot of these folks out there. Right. And getting to serve with one and get to know him really well has been a real treat. So today we're going to interview Major John J.B. Boswell. He's currently my DO and a good one at that. So props to you, sir. And he's going to bring us some background information on I mean, I don't even know how to describe this Shangri-La of an opportunity <laughs> right. that is the Olmsted Scholar Program. And you're just not going to get this kind of truth from a whole lot of people. And so props to him for coming on and trying to share this information. Mm -hmm. He's so willing to give and to explain and to teach. And he gets a lot of questions about it. And so the audience is in for a real treat. Absolutely. I love this episode. I love this interview with JB. It is so good and it hurts my heart so much. And we're going to get into this in the commentary, but this unicorn of a program, this Shangri-La as you described it, is the thing that I have coveted and wanted my entire Air Force career. And so with heavy heart, let's turn it over to Major Boswell and his explanation of the Olmsted program. Today, I am joined by my good friend, Major John J.B. Boswell. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks so much, Reed. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, looking forward to talking to you today about just another one of those incredible opportunities not a lot of people know about. Maybe they've heard, they've heard whisperings, you know, these mythical unicorns that exist, and that is the Olmsted Scholar. Yeah. So before we get there, why don't you talk to us a little bit about you? You know, how did you find yourself in the Air Force? Where are you from? How'd you commission? All that kind of thing. And then we'll start talking about this mysterious, amazing program that is the Olmsted Scholar Program. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Reed. It's awesome to be here. And I really appreciate what you and Colin are doing through this podcast. I'm really happy to talk to you today about Olmsted. I'll talk a little bit about how I got to Olmsted and where I am right now. So... I grew up in the Solomon Islands, son of a missionary family, and spent about 10 years growing up overseas. Came back to the U.S., had a culture shock of my own in high school, and then tried to figure out where to go to college, how to pay for college. And I ended up at Baylor University for faith purposes and what I wanted to study. I really wanted to study international relations, international studies for undergrad, and they had a robust program. So I joined Air Force ROTC, and my plan going in was to do four years of ROTC and then do four years in the Air Force, you know, do my payback time, and then get out and apply for the State Department or apply for another government agency to get back overseas to work in foreign relations, okay. international relations. And so that was my goal going in. Ended up studying international studies, graduated, commissioned back in 2007, and then got sent off to Intel school. And so when I was in ROTC, we got to put in kind of our dream sheet of what jobs we would want. Mm -hmm. And Intel was, 14N was definitely at the top of my list going in. I found out that I couldn't do Air Force Band necessarily as a second lieutenant. Okay, I'd been a musician and choirs and leading church music and stuff. So... I thought, you know, what would set me up for a career in international relations? And I thought that Intel, that being an intelligence officer would pair really nicely with that kind of future outlook. I think that's a pretty common thing. Yeah. I, I come from a very technical background and I feel not common in yeah. the Intel world. I feel more of my peers have a background more similar to yours. So I yeah. think that's a pretty common attitude out there. Yeah, I think so too. And it makes sense, right? In Intel... 
I think that having folks interested in foreign relations brings in officers with, you know, strategic curiosity, global curiosity to really dive into the missions that we're supporting. So, yeah, I've seen the same. I studied some foreign languages while I was at Baylor University Mm -hmm. and studied some French, some Spanish. Anyway, graduated, commissioned, went off to Goodfellow Air Force Base, where our tech school is for Mm -hmm. 14Ns. I know you've been there as well, right? Absolutely. Spent seven months in San Angelo, Texas, and then finished that out and went to Hawaii, right? I had never been to Hawaii as an adult, and going to Hawaii, I got to work in DGS operations, and the DGS was... It was kind of nascent in what we were doing. We were working 24-7 support of remotely piloted aircraft Mm -hmm. in CENTCOM primarily. And so I would go into work, work 12 hours with my crew of 15 airmen, and we would all of a sudden transport ourselves virtually to Afghanistan or Iraq and provide reporting overwatch for operations going on Iraqi freedom and for enduring freedom. And so as a second lieutenant, that was a kind of a reality check. Like, hey, I'm 22 years old, 23 years old, Mm -hmm. and we're watching troops on the ground get shot at. We're watching enemy forces implant, you know, IEDs, insurgents plant IEDs and, and target our guys. So really like the life and death aspect of the Air Force and what it meant to be serving in combat arms. I mean, it really kind of hit home with me. And so did that for a few years, got to deploy to Afghanistan. And really that kind of brought everything together of what I was seeing from thousands of miles away on full motion video. Now all of a sudden was right in front of me Yeah, and got to deploy with special operators there. And at that point I was coming up on my four years in the air force and I was just having too much fun, right? I didn't yeah. want to I didn't want to go ahead and apply to the state department or to law school or whatever to take the next step and so I kind of started biding my time. I came back, figured out that I could go to Korea for 1 year. Mm-hmm. And so I figured, oh, why not? Why not go see some more of the world? It's just one more year, right? Yeah. Went to Korea. During that time, I had met my wife Lauren at a college football game when I was home from Hawaii after my deployment Mm -hmm. and we connected and started dating long distance. And, and then she got kind of interested in this adventure that was the air force and living overseas and travel. And so she was up for it. So coming out of Korea, I had the option to either get out again or put in for somewhere new and got sent to Germany for a few years. Wow. And so just, how did, how did you get get lucky? Hawaii, Korea, Germany. Yeah, I I really, really (laughs) lucked out. I mean, part of it's timing, right? It is. But got to go to Germany, which was an amazing experience, obviously for the travel and location, but really for the work as well. And so I was in Germany working at the Air Operations Center Mm -hmm. when Russia essentially invaded Ukraine back in 2014. I was working the air and air defense cell, their analysis cell. And I was working that desk when Malaysian Air MH17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine. I mean, I've been really fortunate to work in a bunch of different AORs for a bunch of different combatant commands, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from PACOM, but really working in CENTCOM to going to Korea and focusing on the peninsula and then over to Europe, focusing on UCOM and kind of a resurgent Russia Mm -hmm. competition with Russia is just fascinating. And then coming out of Germany, I needed to decide if I was going to stay in the Air Force, make it a career, or if it was time to look at other options, right? And so Lauren and I weighed our options. I had heard about this FAO thing, this foreign area officer thing, right? It used to be a core Air Force specialty for officers. Mm -hmm. And years ago, they did away with that, became a RAS, a regional affairs specialist, And then when I was in Germany, I think they were just starting to transition back to FAO, which aligned with the joint communities terminology for the program. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for FAO, thinking it'd be really cool to go learn a foreign language again or get pretty good at a foreign language, go off to the Defense Language Institute, live in Monterey for a little bit, and then go work in an embassy 
either as a security cooperation officer or a defense attache or something like that. Kind of the nexus of your military career and your education and your previous interests kind of all coming together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so I applied for the program and was accepted into FAO. Mm -hmm. And while I was trying to figure out the FAO thing, I also had this opportunity to apply for the Olmstead Scholar Program. Okay. And so Olmstead first kind of got on my radar when I was a lieutenant back in Hawaii. So let's rewind back to the Hawaii days. And I knew a guy who kind of knew a guy who knew a guy who'd gone yeah. through Olmstead. That's kind of how it is, you right? Know? I yeah. mean, you're, you're unicorns out there. Let's be real. Yeah. There's just not a whole lot. Well, yeah. And we'll talk through the numbers, right? Yeah. It is a selective program with just a few Air Force officers going through each year. But we've had a few 14Ns go through the program, information mm -hmm. warfare officers, some 17Xs go through the program as well. And so it seems like once every few years, you have a 14N come in. So I had heard about this program years ago, and I just, I mean, it was a long shot, right? Like there was no chance I would get this program. And so in order to apply for the program, I had to have competitive D-Lab score, defense language aptitude battery score, yep. um, which fortunately I had from my language exposure growing up and in college, then a competitive GRE, you know, for graduate studies. And then more importantly, you just had to have a really competitive record. I got lucky, again, back to the timing thing, in that I was the exec for the director of intelligence for USAFI and Af Africa, okay. combined position. Mm -hmm. And so, and she had been a part of the Air Force Intelligence Developmental Team, 14N Developmental Team, Career Field Manager. Okay. And so she provided a lot of mentorship. Yeah. And, you know, still kind of set the expectations, managed expectations that it was a long shot. But, hey, I threw my name in the hat, right? I went yeah. through the application process. And Lauren and I decided if we were going to be accepted into Olmstead, mm -hmm. which had a three-for-one active duty service commitment payback, essentially, three year to one year. Meaning if you do one year in Olmstead, yeah. you have three years, you owe the Air Force, for each year. Yep. Wow. And it's yep. a three year program, it's correct? It's a three year program. So that's and a nine year commitment, yes. essentially. Yep. Wow. Essentially. It was a little different because your first year was for language school. Sure. And then your years would start ticking off while you were in the program. So oh, okay. we'll call it like a seven okay. year commitment. Still, that's probably the outside of the flying positions with a 10 year. That's the highest I've heard in any other way. Yeah, absolutely. So at that point, we were all in that if we get accepted for this program, you know, I'm staying in the Air Force, we're yeah. going to finish out at least 20. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we're having a lot of fun, right? Yeah. And I'm enjoying the mission, I'm enjoying the people, and I've gotten really lucky with where we've lived, right? Yeah, yeah. So the Olmstead program, I'd love to talk about what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get to it. So I've actually got some slides that you very graciously provided us from the Olmstead Foundation. And I'm just going to read this mission statement. We've all seen yeah. a lot of mission statements. Um, they don't always mean a whole lot. So you're going to have to translate this for us. But, okay. you know, I'll just uh, put on my best radio announcer voice here. <laughs> to provide outstanding young military leaders an unsurpassed opportunity to achieve fluency in a foreign language, pursue graduate study at an overseas university and acquire an in-depth understanding of foreign cultures, thereby further equipping them to serve in positions of great responsibility as senior leaders in the United States Armed Forces. Boom. That was that was a great radio voice. Thank you, read, John, by the way. <laughs> I think the key takeaway from this mission statement is the thereby. Okay. Which is really the objective of the program. So the thereby further equipping young officers to serve in positions of great responsibility as senior leaders. And talking to the Olmstead Board of Directors, the foundation officers, the foundation is looking for young O4s, senior O3s, young officers, mm -hmm. kind of the midpoint in their careers, to go through this program, to be stretched beyond their comfort zones, to be exposed to different cultures and ideas, have to learn a language as an adult, oftentimes with times with kids and families also learning those languages and being mm -hmm. thrown in the same immersion. Yeah. And come out of that as a better person, but as a more well-rounded and broadened leader to come back and lead 
in whatever core career field and whatever service that you came from. And so the Olmstead Foundation is really focused in on grooming, mentoring, producing leaders, really like the next generation of leaders to go on to be senior general officers, flag officers. Mm -hmm. We've had Olmstead scholars go on to be astronauts, national security advisors to the president, congressmen. And so that's the foundation's goal. A byproduct of Olmstead, though, and I get this question a lot from folks interested, is that you also come out as a foreign area officer. So back to that FAO piece. Yeah. Right? Okay. So in my view, it was kind of a win-win. I'd wanted to be a FAO. I wanted to have that as an option to maybe go and work as an attache, a defense air attache mm -hmm. in the future. But that's not the primary objective for Olmstead. The primary objective is the leadership development go on to command, specifically 05 command and beyond. Okay. And then if you get that 16 Foxtrot foreign area officer AFSC as a secondary AFSC. Okay. And then you have the opportunity now, if you wanted to recore as a 16 Foxtrot, FAO in the Air Force, FAO has now become its own or re-become its own. Yeah, everything's all the new again, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it's now an option to be your primary AFSC, but it's not mandatory that Olmstead scholars do that FAO payback. Okay. So two things briefly. Let's chat real quick about what a FAO does and you know what a defense attache does. You and I know what it is, but I don't know how many of our audience do. Just like, you know, what's the quick elevator speech? What does a FAO do? Yeah. So a FAO, the 16 Foxtrots occupy staff positions. They'll work at the Pentagon or on air staff or whatever, joint staff, across combatant commands, across MAGCOMs, mm -hmm. as really regional advisors and strategists, if you will, okay. for planning. So for okay. joint operational planning and air operational planning purposes on MAGCOMs. And then FAOs can also fill overseas embassy billets, working as air attaches, working as security cooperation officers. And those are both different too, right? The air attache is really kind of the diplomat of the Air Force to okay. whatever country. And mm -hmm. so you're kind of the face of the United States Air Force. You know, in Lima, Peru, you're the face to the Peruvian Air Force and the Peruvian government okay. for the U.S. Air Force. Wow. The security cooperation officer is working typically in the military group. And that is, you know, specific to different countries. Some embassies have massive security cooperation offices sure. and some, you know, obviously have, have a smaller scale ones, but there you're working through what military support and partnerships and foreign military sales look like for those different countries. Okay. Right. So, okay. And then beyond that, FAOs can also fill institutional requirements. We have various international officer training schools and programs. And okay. so there are some FAO command opportunities. Wow. You okay. can go down to San Antonio and command international exchange school, essentially. Okay. Wow. It's a lot bigger thing than I imagined. And it's also very attractive. Right. I can see yeah. the allure. You say, you know, before we were recording today, you talked about how you get these questions a lot. Yeah. I can see why. It's a yeah. pretty exciting opportunity. So, okay, we read the mission statement. Yeah. But what is Olmstead? That's yeah, the yeah. second part of my question. So you get selected and then what? What's kind of like the nuts and bolts logistics of what happens for an yeah. Olmstead scholar? Yeah. So even for the selection itself, the Olmstead Foundation officially says, and actually this will come out in the Air Force PSDMs. They okay. come out and announce the Olmstead application requirements and timeline. Mm -hmm. It'll come out and it'll say it's open to officers from these line of the Air Force career fields. And there's a long list of about, uh, you know, a dozen Air Force career fields mm -hmm. that are eligible and that they're looking for officers between three and 11 years of total active duty service. Okay. That's the foundation stance. And that's the official, you know, that's the line that the yeah. Air Force pushes out. I mm -hmm. will say, and this is backed up by trends and historical data, and we can go back and query old scholars and yeah. who was accepted when at what point in their career. But for the Air Force, 
because Olmstead also counts as an IDE, an Intermediate Developmental Education Program, mm -hmm. which targets the 04 major years, yeah. that folks accepted into Olmstead are typically very senior 03s or junior 04s even. Okay. So right around that nine to 10 year mark yep, more. Exactly. Okay. So it's a mid-career program. Mm -hmm. So even if you hear that three years, you know, and you're a first lieutenant or a young captain interested in Olmstead, I would advise you to get some more operational experience as okay. a company grade officer mm -hmm. and really, you know, try to line up the timing so that Olmstead is your IDE. Got it. Okay. Experience. And so, for example, I applied when I was at about my nine year mark and okay. I was coming up for major mm -hmm. and I actually had my majors board and my PRF going on at the same time as my Olmstead application. Okay. So anyway, just something to keep in mind because I'd get questions from a lot of younger officers and I think it's awesome to be thinking ahead, right? I, yeah. as a, I heard about the program as a lieutenant. I kept it in the back of my mind for years as yeah. a captain, but you really want to line up the timing for kind of that sweet spot at that nine or 10 year mark. Yeah. And then also think about the requirements of how much time on station you need, right? Okay. You're not going to mm -hmm. PCS early for Olmstead necessarily. Yeah. Colin and I are big fans of telling people they need to understand what the rules of the game are because you could make a decision as a first lieutenant that could offset your timing yeah. or put you in the wrong spot, if you will to apply for something that you really want. So it's good to kind of have these things out in front. And that's good yeah. to also know that, yes, it says 3 to 11, but realistically for the Air Force, we're talking 9 to 10 kind right. of. Right. Yeah, oh, that's good. So the other thing in the application, the PSDM that'll come out is, you know, it's a FAO developmental program. We've kind of talked about that, how that's really a byproduct, if mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Talked about the timing the other thing about the application is you don't really understand going into it just how long it takes to get through the application. Mm -hmm. The PSDM comes out summertime. Okay. And then typically your application is due by the end of summer. You find out in the fall that you're an Air Force finalist. Okay. And so we'll say 100 Air Force officers apply for this opportunity, get the senior rater endorsement, and then approximately... 12 to 15 are probably identified as finalists. Okay. Once you're selected by the Air Force Board at AFPC, mm -hmm. and that is all a mystery, right? Yeah. I mean, like any other promotion or special program selection board, you know, there's not a whole lot of, I would say even more so than a promotion board. There's just very limited data. And so mm -hmm. I think what the Air Force is identifying is who looks the best on paper, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so also more senior officers are going to have an advantage of just more experience, right? Yeah. More opportunities for the deployments, the awards, the stratifications, the senior rater push, right? Yeah. So, so that's another reason to wait a little bit. Okay. And then the Air Force selects these members to be interviewed by the foundation. But what they don't tell you is you spend all this time racking your brain about what countries and what schools you should put down on your application. Yeah. And really, there's time later on when you talk to the foundation, there's some time to kind of reassess that. And that's going to be, if you're a finalist, that's a discussion with the foundation to kind of work through what makes sense for you. And what makes sense for the foundation's requirements, right? Because okay. they have certain countries that they're looking to send officers to. Okay. So then the Olmstead Foundation interviews folks typically in late fall or maybe right after the holiday period. Okay. So, you know, I put my application in August, was notified in October that I was an Air Force finalist, had my interview with the foundation via telephone, mm -hmm. like an hour long interview with the foundation standard interview. I'm not going to give away any interview secrets here, but I mean, bottom line is they want to know why you want to do the program, mm -hmm. right? And what this means for you, for your career, your goals, and also for your family, Yeah, right? Okay. And then also why you want to go to whatever country you've identified as sure. your, your top choice and what you want to study. And so you have the interview and then the board of directors for Olmstead always meets in the March timeframe, or at least in recent history. That's when they all get together and they talk through all the noms from every service. All five services are represented, even the Coast Guard. Okay. Now we've had three Coast Guard scholars okay. come through, which is awesome. 
and the board of directors will pick the final list, right? Okay. And so, man, that waiting period between, and I had to wait like over Christmas, over the holidays. Yeah, they don't even meet till March. Right. Um, oh my word. But the interviews are staggered, right? So yeah. I think okay. I probably had okay. mine kind of early. Some people might interview in January or February. Got it, okay. It's just that waiting game. And so then I found out in March, we found out in late March, we were going to Cape Town, South Africa, which was our number one choice. Yeah. We had it on our list. I had discussed it with the foundation and we're going to Cape Town. I'm going to study at the University of Stellenbosch. We're going to go learn Afrikaans at okay. the Defense Language Institute. Wow. So you knew that you had made the Air Force's cut, but is there still another cut in there? So you know you make the Air Force's cut because you're notified that you're going to have an interview yeah. with the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next cut is really the final list. And you wow. don't get any feedback, right? It's just and so John Boswell is going to be going to South Africa. Like, that's it. Yeah. Holy smokes. It. You get a call from your, you know, your senior raider, your supervisor. Yeah. And... I still remember the phone call from my boss. She mm -hmm. was TDY, but she'd gotten notified. Yeah. And so we get this just kind of random call after waiting for months. You yeah. Know, that, you almost don't know what the call's about. Yeah, not at all. And your life's changed, right? You know that for the next few years, you're going to have a totally different, unique experience. Yeah. And so, yeah, we'll fast forward to how I got to Peru. Okay. <laughs> so... We started in Olmsted. We started in Afrikaans, going to DLI. We moved to DC. We did a few months of, so I say we because spouses sometimes have the opportunity to also go to the language training. Okay. If DLI agrees to it. Mm -hmm. So if there's space in the class and you can go to Monterey for DLI West or you can go to Washington DC for DLI East. Okay. Typically Monterey has the more kind of prolific languages. Yeah. And then DC is going to have a lot more of the kind of the one-off unique languages. Sure. And DLI hadn't taught Afrikaans in years, right? There's not yeah. a huge strategic need for Afrikaans <laughs> linguists yeah, yeah. in the DOD. Sure. Right? Yeah. So DLI found us a language tutor in Afrikaans, a South African living in the DC area. And my wife, Lauren, and I went to class every day with them in civvies, right? Mm -hmm. And my work for language school was to learn the language. That's yeah. all I did, right? Yeah, we had homework, we had some field trips. And then you're gearing up for the DLPT, the uh -huh. Defense Language Proficiency Test, which fortunately I had taken before in some other languages, kind of gearing up for FAO, right? Yeah. So I'd had yeah. that experience. But more importantly, we were there knowing that we were going to have to move to a place and use that language for everyday life, right? Yeah. Like that's how we were going to get by. This wasn't just for like official business, right? Yeah. Just writing memos in the foreign language. This was for like going to class. Yeah. For going to church, for ordering, I mean, for everything, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I've been in your shoes in that regard. Yeah. You know, intense language training because they're going to drop you in country for a couple of years and it's yeah. like, you got to figure it out. Yeah. So I totally feel yeah. <laughs> that pressure. But Afrikaans, it's so unfamiliar. I'm sure yeah. that was at, to some degree a little bit over. It's not like you can go to your average DVD, <laughs> go to the right. language section, and then play it in a different language, right. you know, because Afrikaans isn't on that list usually. Yeah, yeah, not a lot of dub overs and, yeah, yeah. you know, subtitles in Afrikaans. Some good YouTube options, some old Afrikaans TV shows and newscasts yeah. and stuff like that, some songs that we were able to, to get into, but we geared up for South Africa. Okay. We were excited to be the first scholars in South Africa, one of the first kind of sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. families. And I'd been working in Europe looking at Africa as part of the USAFI Af Africa, AFRICOM support. Uh -huh. So I was really interested in South Africa's strategic role. But about halfway through, we got, you know, I want to say it was on like a Friday we got a heads up that South Africa wasn't going to work out. Just the security agreement with the U.S. Embassy and the State Department would not support us going to South Africa. So five months of Afrikaans. Oh, my word. Language in and looking at houses and, and all the wineries we were going to visit yeah. in oh. Stellenbosch yeah. was, was out the door. So that was a year after we had found out we were going to South Africa. And so we had just been planning our lives like— uh you know, all the trips we're going to take. Mm -hmm. So 
the foundation was gracious and worked with us really carefully. And they said, hey, you've studied some Spanish, some French. Afrikaans is, is a lot like Dutch. There's a lot of vocab overlap, at least. So mm -hmm. look at countries with those languages okay. instead as an option to kind of re-vector you, do a really quick language spin up, yeah, and then still stay on track to get in country and start my master's. And so we had not really traveled or experienced or really knew anything about South America. Okay. We had just come from Europe. And so while we would have loved to go to France or Belgium or Switzerland or a French speaking place yeah, or Amsterdam or, you know, the Netherlands for Dutch, mm -hmm. we decided to go somewhere totally new because the point of the program is to broaden us, to yeah, stretch, stretch us, stretching. right? Yeah. And so we wanted to go somewhere completely foreign. And so just kind of over the weekend, you know, talked to a few people who'd been to Peru. There had been two other Olmsted scholars a few okay. years before, mm -hmm. one Air Force, one Army. Had some phone calls with them, looked at our options. And like everything else in South America had a, every other country that was eligible really had a scholar already in place, right? And so okay, really Peru is almost our only option for South America. And we just... You know, didn't know anything about it. Had to like Google image what Lima looked like. Yeah, and yeah. Thought, oh, it's on the Pacific Ocean. I think we could deal with that. Oh, there's <laughs> Machu Picchu. There's, yeah, yeah. You know, the Amazon starts in Peru. Essentially, I think we could deal with that. And so, switched to Spanish. Did a crash course. Lauren got a private tutor. The foundation does pay for spouses to get language training if DLI won't support. So okay. there's a grant for spouses to get language training. Yeah. There's also a grant once you're in country. So we can talk about what Olmstead covers. There's a grant to cover your school, so your master's program. And I'll mm -hmm. talk about that in a second. And there's also a grant to cover your travels. And okay. so, you know, they give it to you based on your family size. Yeah. And you get it per year. But that really helps offset a lot of the travel that's really expected as one of the objectives of broadening your cultural understanding and your regional expertise. And so anyway, got to Peru and I'll shut up and we can dive in there. But I just wanted to to stop blabbing for a second. So no, that's amazing. I, I mean, what a path, right? I mean, it's not something you would have probably drawn out and said, this is what I would choose. Yeah. But you've already mentioned, that's kind of part of the point, not the, hey, let's rip your live out from under you. You know, we had this yeah. plan. But if the point is to teach and to grow and for you to learn, that's definitely a one way to do it. So you said you already had some Spanish. Yeah. Do you find that most successful applicants already have a foreign language? That's a great question. And I think the answer is actually... It doesn't matter. Okay. Because back to the point of looking for leaders and developing leaders, the D lab is important as an indicator that you're capable of learning a language. Uh huh. Whereas your current language skills or your, you know, whatever DLPT you might have or previous languages is less important to the foundation. And okay. I think that some of the, I would say most successful scholars in that they've really been pushed outside their comfort zones are probably scholars who have never studied a foreign language. Interesting. You know, and so they come out really having their minds blown. Yeah. But it's hard enough. I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know. Even, I mean, if you learned a language as a younger person. Yeah and haven't used it daily, Yeah, it absolutely goes away. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. I learned Spanish when I was 19. I lived in Spain for two years. Yeah. I tested very well on the DLPT seven years later. I guarantee <laughs> my level and skills are, you know, significantly atrophied. Yeah, Just because I don't use it. So Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I can see that being really important. Yeah, I had taken some high school and college Spanish, you know, and then um, 10 years later yeah. was confronted with having to get a master's degree in history completely in Spanish, wow. writing my papers in Spanish, presenting in class, eventually doing a 150-page thesis and presenting and defending that in Spanish. Yeah. And I just remember showing up at the university. I'm sure I sounded like a six-year-old. Yeah. Interviewing for this prestigious Peruvian history degree, just like not sure if my conjugation was right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know if it was the past imperfect yeah. tense. Like, what mm -hmm. am I supposed to be saying here? And it really does kind of tear you down. Yeah. 
you're coming from kind of being at the top of your game in whatever career field and, you know, in my case, a very high ops tempo exec job mm -hmm. out in Europe. And then you just kind of get thrown out there to figure it out on your own, set yeah. your own schedule, figure out who to talk to, figure out what you want to study. And so there are degree requirements that you have to study more or less a like an arts degree yeah. or humanities degree, I should say, right? Yeah, I was looking at the requirements that you had in the slides and I was, I found that very interesting that it very deliberately steers you away from some of the things that the Air Force values highest in its other yeah. degree expectations. It's like yeah. you can't do STEM. Right. <laughs> and I found that very interesting. So is it the broadening of the education that they're trying to achieve there? Explain that a little bit. I think that's an yeah. interesting point. Yeah, I think it is the broadening read and i think that for stem a lot of the degrees if you're if you're going off to peru to study an mba most of your classes are going to be in english right international language of business yeah the same would go for if you show up and you're doing an economy degree they will allow some economy degrees but there has to be a cultural historical, social, political background to whatever you're studying. Okay. Well, and that makes sense. The language of science is also English. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, yeah, I hadn't thought of it in that way. They really, really want you to become culturally competent. Right. Like they're not just throwing you in the deep end. They're like holding you under. Right. <laughs> and a lot, Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the folks who come into Olmstead are coming in from those technical backgrounds already. Yeah. Right. Again, that's what the Air Force especially yep. is recruiting. So that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. So now let's throw them in the deep end and hold their heads under. <laughs> all right. While they wow. try to figure out what a history book looks like. Yeah. You know, and that's great. So let's very briefly, there's something that you've mentioned a few times that there's money provided by the foundation. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious, how is this like legal? I mean, yeah, there's like yeah. a private organization working with the federal government, like who's your boss during yeah, this yeah. whole thing? Like, yeah. how does this work? Yeah. Great questions again, Reed, as always. <laughs> so quick history lesson on the Olmstead Foundation, the General George and Carol Olmstead Foundation was started back in 1959, when we had our first class of scholars go through, by a retired Army Major General, George Olmsted. And so George Olmsted went to West Point in the 20s. He left the Army and became a reservist while he was a businessman in the 30s. And then World War II kicked off, and he was called back and served in the Pacific Theater, specifically working and coordinating with the Chinese mm -hmm. and the British for resupply and logistics to cross from India, you know, British Imperial India mm -hmm. across the Himalayas and the yeah, over the hump, over the hump, exactly to the Chinese okay. military. And so he realized working there that the U.S. military and especially officers were not on the same level with our international counterparts at understanding other cultures, history, language. We just, we were behind the curve, right? And so he coming out of the army and he retired as a major general, but he realized that our officers needed to be educated more broadly in order to compete and to excel. And so that was General Olmsted's vision. And so he was a successful businessman. He was able to start a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. following his retirement. And I think there was you know, part of the relationship between Olmsted and the DOD and the U.S. government is that Olmsted has, General Olmsted himself was, he was a retired general officer. He had a lot of connections in the federal government. Mm -hmm. And I think he made a really good case that he would, essentially a foundation would pay for students to go get degrees mm -hmm. and travel as long as the military would just cut these officers out for a couple of years of their core career fields, still pay their salaries, still pay their housing, mm -hmm. like any assignment, but anything extra would be covered by the foundation. And so okay. this would also be a way to, you know, you're essentially... It's free training for the military yeah. in a lot of ways. It's free yeah. leadership development. 
It's also, now that we count it towards intermediate developmental education, mm -hmm. there's a, a byproduct there. The Air Force adds the, the FAO AFSC. So there are a lot of benefits for the DOD and for the military as well. Okay. That's a super interesting relationship that yeah. you have a, essentially what's a nonprofit organization through, you know, handshakes. Is it more formal than that? Is it more? It's absolutely more formal okay, than okay. that. And there are official agreements with the DOD and there's okay. legislation to back it up. And okay. its foundation's been in place now for, you know, since the late 50s, 1950s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the foundation continues to produce results. Yeah. The DOD wouldn't keep it around absolutely. if it wasn't. Absolutely. And so there have been more than 700 scholars in 60 plus countries. And, you know, looking at the breakout, I think about 10% of those scholars have gone on to be general officers or flag officers. And wow. so the that's Olmstead, a crazy, crazy high rate. It is. It wow. is much higher than your standard line of the DOD, right? Yeah. So the Olmsted Foundation is doing a very effective job at selecting young officers with leadership potential, but then also developing those officers to go on to command and lead at higher levels. Awesome. I know before we recorded, part of what you wanted to do is to kind of sell the program. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, buying. Yeah. I'm not. I'm basically ineligible at this point, but. I think there's still time, Reed. Somebody can't dream, right? I don't know. I'll do the math. Okay. So let's talk about your time in Peru. Yeah. Let's talk about you, your wife's experience. Yeah. I know you want to bring that up because a lot yeah. of these people... At this point in their careers, most of my peers now have a family, you know, maybe they're starting to think about children. I mean, there's kind of a lot going on at this time frame. So I want to hear about your experience and how it went for you and your wife and, you know, yeah. just keep selling it. I'm buying, but let's keep selling it. <laughs> awesome. So Lauren and I went to Peru, didn't have any kids mm -hmm. um, with us at the time, but she was able to... One, she got the language training through mm -hmm. the grant, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's become fluent in Spanish as well. She was able to use that Spanish to volunteer at Peruvian orphanages, mm -hmm. to volunteer as an English teacher okay. for a lot of the indigenous people of Peru. And so she was able to, you know, get her own kind of Olmstead cultural immersion while yeah. I was doing my master's degree. Yeah. Um, but also she was my travel partner right? Oh, sure. And helped plan a lot of our trips and did a lot of that organizing. Yeah. You've said we almost every time yeah. you've talked about it. It seems like it really is much more of a combined effort than dad or mom is going to go do their Olmstead thing and then everybody else is going to live their lives. It seems like it's much more integrated. It is. And it's also the most time in my Air Force career that Lauren and I have gotten to spend together. Yeah. For my master's classes, I had class just a few days a week mm -hmm. and a lot of times at night, but we had full days together to plan trips, to you know go volunteer together. We got to spend a lot of time together. So yeah. especially if you're used to deploying or you know, you've been separated from your spouse, this is a time back with the family as a family unit to go through this. We had friends in South America for example, who brought kids who attended schools in Chile and Argentina. Wow. And the kids came out as eight-year-olds, five-year-olds speaking better Spanish than the parents did, <laughs> right? And so yeah. it really is a whole family experience. Mm -hmm. And and that's another goal of the foundation is to make sure that, that the whole family is on board for this, right? Yeah. In order to be successful in this kind of environment in a foreign country, really without a lot of military support that yeah. you'd be used to. It's not like I had a base to yeah. report to. I mean, yeah. we had the embassy with some contacts there for mail and kind of basic assistance. But, you know, you were figuring out your own medical appointments through TRICARE remote or TRICARE, yeah. you know, international. Mm -hmm. And you're really out there on your own. And so it is important to make sure the family's all in. Yeah. And... Every couple that we've talked to, every family we've talked to with young kids has said it's just been the most enriching family experience. And Lauren would share that sentiment just for her, mm -hmm. you know, even without us having kids there. Yeah. Awesome. What was the thing that either happened to you or came as a result of your time that has most surprised you? You knew you're going to get a degree. You knew you were going to get some language experience. But what is the thing that 
that you did not expect. Yeah. That was the result. Ooh. I didn't expect the amount of flexibility that the program presented. I didn't, you know, back to your analogy of being thrown in the deep end and having your head, you know, held under the water, essentially. Yeah. I didn't realize that, you know, you had so much flexibility and so much creativity going into the program. I was expecting like a very structured Air Force Institute of Technology AFIT program. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who officially, for the Air Force, they're the ones you officially report to. So my okay. senior raider signing my training reports was back at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base yep. in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And we'd have phone calls every once in a while. Yeah. But really, you're only talking to the Air Force for housing allowance, to coordinate your PCS yeah. in and out. But you're just thrown out there, man. They, yeah. they tell you to go figure out a local realtor, go find a place to live, figure out your school, figure out, I mean, everything, right? Yeah. I just didn't know. I just figured, oh, it's a DOD program. It's going to be structured, you know? Yeah. And it is... But there's just, you know, there's an Olmstead hashtag, which is the Olmstead experience, mm -hmm. but it really is my Olmstead experience <laughs> yeah. or your Olmstead experience. Yeah. Every experience is unique. Yeah. And so no matter how much preparation you do talking to other folks, even folks who are in the same country, their experience is going to be totally different. Yeah. That's really interesting. You talk to people who are right on the edge of retirement or separation and the things that they are most shocked by or most unprepared for is the lack of structure. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're like, oh, I have to find a doctor. I've never yeah. done that before. <laughs> right. Have, you know, and I mean, for crying out loud, we have a legal office. Like if we have any legal troubles, we just yeah. call them up on the yeah. phone. Like I've never had a lawyer on retainer, but I have a whole <laughs> office available to me. Yeah. And it sounds like you kind of got to experience some of that yeah. Early. You got to, yeah. you know, nothing like trying to negotiate a contract on a house in a foreign language. I've yeah. done that before. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not fun. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's a really interesting perspective. And we find that even in our day to day. Yeah. The program I'm in right now, it's very much, hey, I'm in charge yeah. of my time. That's right. And not all of us are excited about that. <laughs> hey, what's the plan? <laughs> yeah. uh, the plan is you have the plan. Yeah. But that's what we expect from the military, right? Yep. They tell us how to dress. They tell us how to walk, how to breathe, what to say, you know, yeah. at certain times of day. And you kind of grow into that. Yeah. I can see how forcing you out of that would really force some growth. Yeah. It really does force personal and professional growth. You know, coming back in from Peru, we moved back to D.C., mm -hmm. where we are now. I went to the Pentagon on air staff. And I think what I took away for the military was... I was a lot more, I think, creative in my problem solving. I think that I stopped taking no for an answer. <laughs> you know, living overseas and dealing in a foreign language. I mean, we just realized that every time we asked for something in dealing in the local economy, typically the first answer was no, <laughs> Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so it kind of stretched you to find creative solutions and get to yes. Mm -hmm. And so coming back in to the Pentagon and the staff work, I think it, it just made me better at collaborating. It made me better at thinking outside the box and bringing some of that lack of structure back to this structured world yeah. that we work in, you know? Again, like you said, not things you expected. Yeah. You expect the degree, you expect the language, you're like, <laughs> right. I'm going to be more cross-culturally competent. Right. Yet, it's all the side things that kind of are necessary supports that kind of make that. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. What was your craziest pinch me moment mm. where you where you sat there and thought, how on earth did JB end up in this spot right now having this experience? So can I give you two? You bet. And I want to give you two because one was in Peru and mm -hmm. one was out of Peru. Okay. I'm a huge fan of Peru at this point. Yeah. I think that Peru... You know, it's a cradle of civilization. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the history of it, you've had settlements there for thousands of years, cities there on the coast, Peruvian coast for thousands of years. You have the Andes Mountains. You have the history of the Incas, one of the great American civilizations and that rich history, the mix with colonialism and immigration. And yeah. also it's on the Pacific Rim. And so you have a lot of Chinese interest. 
Japanese immigrant populations. And so it's a very diverse country, which uh -huh. really, really surprised us. Yeah. And then you have the Amazon jungle that starts right there in Peru. And then there's a rich history of relations with the United States. And we saw that across Latin America. We saw that across South America. But I think Peru is just one of these most fascinating kind of otherworldly places, right? Mm -hmm. So my pinch me moment after all that is the first time we went to Machu Picchu. Okay. You, you see it's Machu, on my bucket list. It's on the bucket list. Absolutely go. Yeah. Right. And so everyone's seen photos, everyone's seen travel videos or whatever. And it's a haul to get there. You fight yeah. altitude sickness. You've got to fly across the Andes from Lima to Cusco, which mm -hmm. is this beautiful, beautiful city. And then you take a train and you do some hiking around, right? And you finally get there. And I just remember getting there and it just blew our minds. Yeah. We had lived in Europe. We had seen the Notre Dame and the Eiffel Tower yeah. and Sistine Chapel and all these beautiful wonders of the world, really, right? Architecturally. But this was just this like mix of man and nature in the most kind of unimaginable site where it's this citadel, this, you know, old city essentially perched in the high jungle, kind of an extension of the Andes Mountains. And it's so green. And we had, like, we showed up and we're bummed out because it's cloudy. Yeah. And as we're, mm -hmm. you know, we wait a few minutes trying to decide what we do and the clouds just open up, you yeah. know, and it's the cloud forest. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of where the Amazon starts and it's, it's coffee country and chocolate country and all yeah. this, right? And it just, the clouds opened up and you see the city just perched right there on this ridge and it was breathtaking. Wow. That's my Peru pinch me moment. Okay. We went back to Machu Picchu a few times mm -hmm. with, with different visitors. Sure, yeah. But that first time seeing it is really like nothing that you can explain or imagine or expect. It just, it really does live up to the hype or, you know, it more than lives up to the hype. So my other pinch me moment is we were super fortunate in that we were able to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. was able to, you remember you're on a school schedule, so you have very long summer breaks where essentially your primary duty is to travel. And wow. we had seen a lot of the region. We'd traveled to almost every Latin American country that we could. We couldn't go to Venezuela at the time or Cuba yeah. mm -hmm. or Haiti mm -hmm. in the region, but but everywhere else we got to and kind of the capstone of our travels after going everywhere else and also want it to be known that we paid out of pocket for this. It didn't come from, from the foundation's money, but still important for the region is we got to take a cruise down from Buenos Aires mm -hmm. all the way down around the, the tip of South America. We stopped in Patagonia, which is breathtaking itself. Yeah. Both the Chilean and Argentine sides of Patagonia are spectacular. But then we went down to Antarctica. Oh, my word. And I got, okay. my, I got the seventh <laughs> continent on this cruise. Oh, and wow. It was surreal, right? And that really is like, I mean, that just takes your breath away. Yeah. That's just like, it's unlike any other place I've been. And it's just, you're looking out at like white snow. and <laughs> Yeah. But it's just, nobody lives there, right? Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. That's that awesome. Yeah. This has been really, really amazing. Super fun to have you with us today. I've really enjoyed it and I've learned a ton and I've definitely gotten that bug, even though it's probably not <laughs> going to happen at this point. I just want to wrap up a couple of things. So yeah. you've been super gracious and you've mentioned before and, and before we were recording as well that you love mentoring people, answering questions about yeah. this kind of thing. And so you've offered to put your contact info yeah. in the show notes. We're really excited that you'll be able to answer some questions. Yeah. I'm certain you're going to get some traffic. Uh, this will probably awesome. cause some, Good. you know, inbox bombs from people wanting <laughs> to know how they can do this. Yeah, yeah. But we've also got a slideshow from the foundation yep. that goes through the history background, general, you know, wave top, big hand, small map application kind yeah. of stuff. So that will also be helpful. And it's, um, I'll just add real quickly, Reed, that it's actually Air Force specific. So it spells Fantastic. out which Air Force AFSs, AFSCs mm -hmm. can apply for it, right? So they've tailored this to Air Force scholars. That's awesome. Something we haven't mentioned is the Olmsted Foundation is sponsoring joint scholars. You mentioned this. Yeah. So yeah, it's a really incredible opportunity for all of the DOD. 
And I talked about the Air Force application process and the Air Force timing and what makes sense. It's different across all the services. Yeah. And so if you're listening, if you're tuning in from another joint service, then you know, work with your detailer, work with your assignments team to figure okay. that out. Awesome. So before I ask my favorite last question, what is next for JB? What's next in the cards for you? Yeah. Right now I'm at Fort Meade mm -hmm. in Maryland. So after the Pentagon got to be a squadron director of operations for the 70th Operation Support Squadron, we get to manage or, you know, at least help out with the internship that you're a part of, Reed. Yep, exactly. So this is one of my bosses, everyone. Yeah. He has a lot of bosses. Yeah, right? I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's been an incredible experience as a DO. I have one more year as a squadron DO. That's the plan. And then next year, I'm not sure. I'm still working through that. My assignment options will come out this fall. I think that Lauren and I are starting to get that overseas bug again. Yeah. And so we're looking at getting back overseas, if that means Korea or Germany, and, yeah. and we get lucky enough for that. Or I'm looking at going to a joint staff somewhere, either at a combatant command or back to the Pentagon to be on the joint staff. Okay. And Olmstead actually does kind of groom you for that as well, because yeah. you do interface with the embassy, mm -hmm. which has a joint military, and other scholars that you go through your orientation with and you stay in contact with really for life, yeah. for a lifetime, are joint, right? And so I'd like to take kind of my operational experience and my time as a DO, but also at headquarters Air Force to then go to a joint staff. Yeah. And I've gotten some questions about this. I did decide to not recor as a FAO. Okay. As a primary as a FAO. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to go through my specific reasons for that. But at the end of the day, for my career, I felt like, the 14N career field gave me more opportunities to command. It mm -hmm. gave me more flexibility for assignments than going to be a Southcom FAO yeah. and kind of bouncing between Miami, Florida, maybe Tucson, Arizona, DC, and then whatever country I might get lucky enough to go serve in. Yeah. And so I decided to stay 14N for mm -hmm. the foreseeable future, but I do maintain that secondary 16 Foxtrot. AFSC. Okay. And so I'll see what the future holds. Yeah. And maybe down the line, I, I will get to go back to an embassy. Yeah. Exciting times for sure. Even having those as options. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we joined for the mission, for the opportunities, but we stay for the people. Yeah. And it's nice when they can both line up and be pretty cool. You know, when the opportunities and the people line up, and that's fantastic. So last question, we always ask our, you know, those who are willing to join us, what is an officer? Mm. So I have a tendency to err on the side of verbose. <laughs> so I'll try to be succinct here for you, Reed. The buck stops with you. Okay. At your echelon. Mm -hmm. You're a leader, but that involves different styles of leadership, adaptive leadership. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it calls for you to be an intrusive leader. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it calls for you to lead by example and just lead out in front. And I've had to utilize both of those styles of leadership and other styles of leadership as an officer. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, and when I was a lieutenant, I got this book from a captain mentor of mine and the book was for Army Company Commanders, and it said, don't forget you're in charge. Okay. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. It's a very humbling position to be an Air Force officer. And, I mean, we could keep going on about the different, the importance of relationships with your enlisted troops, with other officers, and with your leaders as well. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. Nice. Love it. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Really glad you were able you. to be here today. Yeah, can't wait to see all the questions that are going to come your way. <laughs> this is awesome. Thanks so much, Reed. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Colin. Reed, I mean, I said at the top of the episode with the introduction that this is the thing that I have wanted more than anything else in my entire Air Force career. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know you know. Yeah. You've been around me for a long time, basically my whole Air Force career, right? Yep. And you saw me when I discovered this thing. You saw me through my applications to it. You saw the aftermath. 
thereafter, which we'll get to here in a second. But is there any doubt on why this program is so incredible? None, at least for me. I, I said it in the episode. I'm buying. It sounds incredible, and it is. And, you know, JB did a fantastic job of describing it, all the ins and outs, and, and really relating his experience to us. And for anyone who loves to learn, loves to experience things, I mean, come on. Come on, man. Yeah. It sounds hard. I'm not going to lie. I learned Spanish to a pretty high level. That sounds awful. <laughs> going to do my master's degree in history and the whole thing in Spanish, that sounds really hard. Not just your master's degree, but learning to live in a foreign country. We'll get into all of that. Yeah. But there's a couple of things that I want to address right up front. You and JB kept talking about these different tests, the D-Lab, D-L-A-B, and the D-L-P-T. I actually have no idea what the DLPT is. I'm going to let you talk about that one. But the D-Lab is the Defense Language Aptitude Battery. And it is a way for the Department of Defense to assess your potential to learn a language. And you mentioned that in the episode, but I want to give a little bit more detail on what it is, what it's like. Yeah. And so the test is administered through your base education office. If you want to go take it, anybody can go there, schedule an appointment. But it's a computer-based test that takes you through the process of learning a completely made up language. And like from the very beginning of these are the letters in this language's alphabet. This is the phonetic sounds that they make. This is how you string them together to form words. This is the grammar. There's a written portion. There's a spoken portion. And through all of this, the DOD gets an idea of how well you are prepared to learn another language, be that Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, it doesn't really matter. But the higher you score, obviously, the better your potential is, better your aptitude for learning a new language. So that's what the D-Lab is. Yeah. A real key with that is, again, you said it's, it's a made-up language. Like, we're not kidding. It's 100% made up. And you cannot use it in any way because it's totally fake. But because it is a fake language, it is an aptitude to all languages. And your score is, you know, like you said, the higher the score, the more able you would be to learn, you know, some of these more complicated languages. So yeah. Also, real quick plug. If you have not taken the D-Lab, take the D-Lab. It can be a benefit to you. It goes on your records. Mm -hmm. You never know what opportunities will arise that having a D-Lab score could be beneficial. I was counseled as a second lieutenant, go take the D-Lab. I took the D-Lab. It's nice to have it on my records. And obviously, you have to have it if you want to apply for the Olmstead. Exactly. So yep. Go get it done. Just get it done. You know, schedule the half day with your supervisor, whatever, make that happen. So the DLPT, the Defense Language Proficiency Test, okay. is a language-specific test to evaluate your abilities in a specific foreign language. Okay. So the scale is on a zero, if you're that talented, zero to five, <laughs> uh, five being like essentially unachievable. No one is going to get a five. And it's funny. Not even natives? Not even natives because they don't know English grammar and English well enough to be able to explain what's going on in the foreign language in English proficiently. Hmm. Like okay. it is really, if you are a five, you are probably a linguistic scholar in both English and the foreign language. I mean, it okay. is very hard to get up that level. Highest I've ever heard is a four and a four plus. Okay. Uh, so that's the score goes zero, zero plus, one, one plus, two, two plus, et cetera. All right. And depending on the language, you have to achieve a certain score in order to be qualified as a linguist. You know, depending on if, you know, usually our enlisted are the linguists out there and they right. have to achieve a specific level of both speaking and listening and written and oral. There's all sorts of levels. You know, once you get a certain score, then you can go on to the next level to see if you can get into the threes and three pluses and fours and stuff okay. like that. It does expire. Oh, interesting. Yes. If you take the DLPT, it will go on your records and it will be there, but it has a date next to it. Okay. So you have to maintain a currency and take the DLPT every so often. It's one of those tests that the farther you go and the more correct answers you give, the harder the test gets, mm. and then the score goes up along with it. So if you're only in there for 15 minutes, that's probably not a good sign with respect to your score. COVID has really hurt DLPT testing because you have to go to the base education center and 
you know, put on the headphones and do the whole thing. So they're, you know, trying to get that back up to snuff. But yeah, the DLPT, Defense Language Proficiency Test. And like the D-Lab, is there any reason to not take it? Like if you have even just cursory level of knowledge from high school classes or something, go take the test, right? Go take it. Absolutely. I've even known officers, you know, JB even mentioned it. He had taken the DLPT in a variety of languages. That was one way for him to signal, hey, this is something I'm interested in. This is something I have some aptitude for. And I've known other officers who are really trying to get into Olmsted or other programs, and they'll take four, five, six DLPTs. And it just shows, hey, this is something I care about. It shows that you're actively working in this area. And it's absolutely something you should do if you have the ability to do so. So highly recommended. Okay. I have not taken the DLPT. Maybe that's something that I need to pursue. I did take some German in high school. I remember like three words of it. And I do speak a foreign language, but I speak Tongan, like South Pacific, the Tongan Islands, the friendly islands, you know? Yeah. And there is not a DLPT for that, by the way. Yeah. So good point. Real quick, the languages, they come and go with respect to how much they matter to the DOD. Mm -hmm. Tongan is not one of those. It is not one of those. You can qualify for pay if your DLPT score is high enough, even if you're not using that in your primary job. If it is on their list of languages we really care about and your score is high enough, you can qualify for language pay. And that's no small thing. So there's a lot of information out there about languages and about those tests. So highly recommended if you have even a an inkling of, of interest. That's really good. And not something that I had known about when I was a lieutenant, you know, eight years ago and interested in applying to the Olmstead. And that kind of gets into where I want to go with this next. So as I forecasted, as I signaled, the Olmsted program is something that I chased super hard yes. as a very young lieutenant. And I talked to my senior leaders about it, my commanders. I talked to people about it. And everybody said, go for it. Yeah, go get it. The eligibility requirements were that I have at least three years in service, which I did as a first lieutenant, and have a passing D-Lab score, which I did. And I was in an AFSC that was eligible as a 32E engineer, but those were the written rules. And you got into this with JB in the interview is that there are some unwritten rules that don't line up with what the written rules were. And nobody ever told me about them. And long story short, after pursuing the Olmstead super hard for a long time, I got to the point where I left the Air Force over it because I butted up against those unwritten rules so hard that I felt like there was no way forward for me. And maybe there really wasn't a way forward for me. Maybe the reality is, as you talked about in the interview, is that really only someone from the operations career fields, you know, the pilots, the intel officers, those are the people who are going to get the opportunity to, to be an Olmsted scholar. Maybe that's actually true. But what really was missing is that. I didn't have the mentorship. I didn't have somebody guiding me. I didn't have someone helping me to understand and navigate and focus my passion either in the right direction towards the Olmstead saying, hey, you can do this, but it's going to be a few more years. Go get some more operational experience. Go do some yeah. other things in the Air Force and then try again later as a senior 03 and a new 04. Yeah. Test on some languages. Yeah. You know, do the DLPT, that kind of thing. Nobody explained that to me. Yeah. And I left the Air Force over it. And so here I am, however many years later, asking myself, what if? Yeah. What if could I have made it? I don't know. Because again, wrong AFSC and timing is everything. And there's got to have a strong record of performance, which I may or may not have had by this point. Point is, be like JB and share. Yes. Help other people to understand what are the written and the unwritten rules for the Olmstead, for becoming a FAO, for applying to AFIT, or becoming an AFROTC instructor, whatever the special program is, or even just within a career field, share with others so that we can avoid the heartache. Yeah. 
No, totally agree. And he's so willing to share. And I'm so glad he was able to come on. You know, JB and I have been trying for a while to narrow down some options. He has a number of things that he has experience in that he wanted to talk about. But this was the thing that he narrowed in on because of how many questions he gets and because of how wide the knowledge gaps are and frankly, how unique it is. Yeah. You know, these are the unicorns, folks. Yeah. They, they don't exist. He is the only Olmsted scholar I've ever met in 10 years of active service. Yeah. I've heard of two other people applying. One of those people made the Air Force cut, which we described in the episode, yeah. did not get ultimately selected. And then he's the only other one. That's it. And so, yeah, really appreciated that he came on and shared, you know, and that kind of leads me to a point I want to discuss. This was a slow burn. Mm -hmm. This did not come overnight. He wanted to do State Department international relations stuff before he even started college. Yeah. And he had this vision and he was using that vision to help guide his decisions in the assignments he selects, in the deployment opportunities he takes in the languages he learns, and the tests, and all this stuff, right? And it took him nine years. Nine years. Nine years plus. Nine years in the Air Force, nine years plus, right? Plus college. Exactly. No, really good point. And he would not have gotten there, to get to your point, without somebody else, without someone helping him, without someone pushing him in the right way and giving him some knowledge. And so, just like you said, we need to do that for others. Yeah, we need to help them get there because now he's made it at least to that place that he really wanted to get to. Now he has the opportunities to explore this world that he has been wanting and clearly is capable and prepared for. Mm -hmm. Son of a missionary family, lived overseas most of his growing up, speaks languages, has now lived and traveled. He's been to the seventh continent. I mean, the list goes on. These are the people we want. Yeah doing international policy for our government. So yeah, absolutely. You've got to share. We've got to share. The next thing I want to talk about, Colin, I want people to think about how valuable this program is. Yeah. And it's really hard for me to capture this. And I'm still not entirely clear how this is legal. And I asked JB that in the episode, <laughs> right? In the interview. You did. You did. There is a foundation established by a rich entrepreneur, former general officer that Congress has passed laws to allow this organization to give money to the DOD for this program, for the intent of developing these people. They're going to leave their primary career fields, and if they are operations career fields, which you know they most likely are, they're probably in high demand. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of them. Right. They're probably some of the best and brightest. So we're taking the best of us yeah. out of the Air Force. And then the Department of Defense is going to continue to pay them. And then we're going to send them off to a foreign country to learn a foreign language, to do an educational program that, as we described, has almost nothing to do with Air Force priorities. Right. Right. We're a very STEM-focused service. Yeah, this is a very much a humanities type of thing. Yeah, you're not allowed to study STEM. That's forbidden. I mean, this is such a departure from what we normally think of as the canonical priorities for our service. That is how valuable it is for the Department of Defense. Oh, and then, by the way, we're going to promote them to general officer at a rate of 10%. That is unreal. <laughs> I, for those who don't have a context for that, it's less than 1%. Less than probably a tenth of 1% of officers actually make it to GO. Oh, yeah. We go through this exercise at SOS, at least we did when I went, where they make the, you know, 500 person audience stand up and go through the math. Okay, this many people sit down. Okay, this is who's going to make 04. This many people sit down. This is who's going to be 05. This many people sit down. This is who's going to make 06. And there's one person standing up. And then they say, okay, everybody stand back up. Everybody but one person sit down. Those were all 06s. And that's the one person to just make general officer. I mean, it's like the numbers are ridiculously low. Yeah. 10%? That's how valuable this program is. Yeah. And oh, by the way, that was just for the Air Force. But yeah, it's a joint program. Keep in mind that the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and soon to be the Space Force all participate in this program. It's unreal. There is nothing where that I can think of where the services are so aligned. Yeah. So 
that got me thinking, what is it about this program that is so valuable? Honestly, I think it's the value of cross-cultural competence to being an effective leader. Mm -hmm. The knowledge of a foreign language, the knowledge of foreign places, cultures, geographies, foods, perspectives, traditions, all of those things that make up what it is to be somewhere else, mm -hmm. that is how much the DOD values it. Yeah. So here we go, Captain Rhetorical again from last week. You know, I'm back, Captain Rhetorical here. What are we doing? What are you doing, Colin? What am I doing to develop myself in that way? Because guess what? I'm not that great. I'm not going to be the unicorn that gets selected for Olmstead. Most of us aren't going to be. Yeah. If you are, good for you. Shoot for that moon. Hopefully you, you get there. But if you don't land on that incredible, you know, opportunity that is Olmstead, what are you doing to try and tap into some of those skills that are clearly valuable? Yeah. Because it's not just valuable for the Olmstead scholar. It's valuable for every single person who can gain some level of competence in cross-cultural communication, empathy for other perspectives outside of the Western way of seeing things. Yeah, we all need to pursue that in some way. Because it's a leadership program. Yeah. It's a leadership program. That was an insight that I did not fully appreciate. And I'm really glad he brought that up and really hammered it home. Yeah. It's a leadership program. It's in the mission statement. It says, do this, send them out there to do that so that the language is thereby further equipping officers to lead. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so you're asking exactly the right question, but let's not just leave it there at what are we doing? Let's try to answer it a little bit, Reed. Yeah. What are things that people can do? What should they do in order to develop some level of cross-cultural competence? First for me is travel. Yeah, that's where I was going to go first too. Yeah, travel. If you don't know the language, good. <laughs> that will make you a little uncomfortable. You know, try to, you know, pointy talk your way through to get a SIM card at the airport so that you can then use Google Voice, you know, and the image search to like translate words for you as you're walking around. Yeah. And so like on those lines, don't travel to like Canada. It's not that we shouldn't go to Canada. I'd love to go. I still haven't. I got to fix that. But Canada, you know, Canadians, they all speak English, right? Don't travel to England. Don't travel to South Africa, even though, you know, that's where JB wanted to go. Yeah. Because they speak English. Yeah. Find some place on the map where the level of English proficiency is low and go there. Yeah. It's uncomfortable, by the way. Yeah. I mean, you can't communicate. You don't know where things are. It probably doesn't meet the same level of standard that you're used to. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's the point. And JB gets into that in the interview that one of the things that he learned, one of the things that most surprised him about the program that I think is really so critical to all of this is it forces you to figure it out. Yeah. In ways we're not used to. Yeah. Absolutely not used to. And I'm glad you brought that up because that kind of gets me to something else I wanted to cover. You know, once people have reached a base level of income, and it's not that high, to be honest, how much money they need to make to get to this place. Money no longer is a motivation for them to be excellent or to excel in what they're doing. It is they need to become an expert. They need to have some sort of self-determination, ability to control what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they need to cause something that they do that they believe in. Becoming an expert, that sounds a whole lot like competence. That's something yeah, we do does. quite well in the United States military. And a cause, something that you believe in, I think also comes with the territory. For sure. Yep. You know, freedom, liberty, those are good reasons. You know, I'm biased, but, you know, whatever. But the ability to choose your path, self-determination, the opportunity to figure it out is something we don't do a whole lot of. They tell me how often I need to shave my face. They tell me how often I need to cut my hair. They tell me what to wear to work every day. They tell me where I'm going to live, who my commander is going to be. All that sort of stuff is predetermined. Yeah. So how can we do this, Colin, as leaders, recognizing how important the ability to figure out is, how do we do that as leaders? I've got some ideas, but what are your thoughts on that? How do we do that for our folks, knowing that this is so important? Yeah, I think... The responsibility as a leader is to paint the vision of what it is that we need to accomplish, you know, point over to the hill over there and say, that's the hill that we need to get to. 
and then let others figure it out. Yes, there is a reason for you as a leader to practice for yourself figuring it out. But if you are figuring everything out, and especially if you're figuring out things for others, then that there is where we run into this problem of lack of self-determination, lack of being able to practice figuring it out. And that causes people to become disenchanted with the Air Force because they feel like they can't be who they truly are. They can't chase the things that they are most interested in. They can't find self-actualization, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I think about this, having a leader who is always figuring everything out for you sounds a whole lot like micromanagement. Yeah, it's another great term for it. And nobody likes working for that guy or gal. Nobody. But you know what's even worse, Colin? What is even worse than working for a micromanager? Because you can understand a micromanager. You know what to expect. You show up, you just wait to be told what to do. You salute smartly and go about your day. Yeah. It's miserable, but you can survive it. You know what's worse, though, is having someone give you the idea that they want you to figure it out and then scrapping your ideas at the last minute and going with what they were going to do. That's even worse. Yeah. That's like a passive aggressive micromanager. That is just awful. Yeah. And so part of what I'm getting at here with, and as you described, you know, this mission type orders, these vision leaders who allow their people to determine how to get the mission done is it's really scary. And it's really hard. Yeah, it is. We're used to having control. We're used to being able to dictate every level. And walking into a situation where you've given your folks the power and the authority to do something and you haven't touched the whole thing and you're not sure what it looks like is hard and scary. But it's exactly what has to happen. Yeah, General Brown talked about it in Accelerate, Change, or Lose that we have to push decision-making authority the motivation and the ability to innovate down to the lowest level possible. And, you know, General Brown's predecessor, General Goldfein, talked about delegating as far down as you are comfortable and then go one more level. Yep, exactly. One more level down. Delegate to where you are uncomfortable. Yeah. Because that is where the growth is going to happen. Yeah. I've had a number of leaders do this, but one in particular that comes to mind is while I was deployed, we were having some some challenges, some interpersonal issues going on in the flight. And our section chief basically said, what do you guys think? Here are the problems I'm seeing. What do you guys think? And he did not offer a solution. It was the first time that that had ever happened, yeah. that a solution was not proposed by the leader. We came up with a plan and I could tell that he did not like the plan. Mm -hmm. I could tell. I could see it in his face and his nonverbals. It was very clear. And he basically said, okay, let's do this. And the amount of risk that took, the amount of humility and just guts to try that out, it worked. We resolved the problem. And what happened in the office? Now all his people believe in themselves yeah. and are empowered. And so guess who got to take more time off? Guess who got to go home a little bit earlier because he could trust his folks to get it done and to put in the extra work the people that he had just empowered. It's incredible what can happen if you can do this. So that's my charge to our folks, you know, that are listening today. Find a way to allow the people around you to determine for themselves. It's not easy in our business. So much is controlled. And I just love how this aspect of the Olmstead is so critical that they do it for three full years with like really high talented folks. Yeah. And then they promote them to geo at 10%. I mean, come on. It's clearly important. And then think why? Why do these types of self-determined people then promote at such a high rate to geo? Well, what kind of problems are you solving at the geo level? All of them. The All big, of them. <laughs> yeah, the big ones. There's no manual for a conflict in a place that we've never been before. Yeah. Like we're in a new era of great power competition with China and Russia that we've never experienced before. There's no manual for this. Yeah. And these general officers, some of whom are Olmsted's alumni, are the ones who are taking everything that they've learned from their time traveling abroad, learning a new language, getting familiar with these different cultures, foods, languages, geographies, all those things so that they can solve these types of problems. And it doesn't necessarily have to be war either. Right, Reed? Yeah. I mean, there was no manual for the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And yet 
these leaders are tasked with solving these kinds of global scale problems. Yeah. And for many leaders out there, the pandemic defined their command tour. Right. And I guarantee no one was talking about a pandemic as they were sitting through their squadron commander course. Right. 100% promise without question. Nobody said, okay, now if you'll turn to chapter three, we'll discuss what to do with global. Pa no, that did not happen. <laughs> Yet, knowledge, skills, and abilities that these Olmstead scholars have developed during their program is going to better equip them for these unknowns. Yeah. And just because you're not going to be an Olmstead scholar doesn't mean you can't do some of these things. Right. Get out there, travel, develop yourself empower your people, use those tools, you can develop some of these things. And I'll tell you, it was so great to have JB come on and explain his experience with the Olmstead Scholar program. He's putting those things in place. It's a pleasure to work for him. And he's a great leader. And he's been a fantastic asset to our squadron. And yeah, really enjoyed it. I know, Colin, this was painful for you. I appreciate your vulnerability. If the audience could just see your face. <laughs> The pain is there, but I appreciate you bearing with us. The pain is there, but so is the gratitude and the appreciation for JB and the people like him and, and to the Olmsted Foundation for providing this type of program that develops leaders to this level. I wish I were one of them. If it were an option for me at this point, I would take it in a heartbeat. Give me a 20-year ADSC and I would still do it. That's not an option for me. But I am so, so grateful that JB was willing to share this knowledge so that people who are coming behind us will be better prepared than I was. Yeah. And that's really all I can ask for from this episode. Yep. And again, so glad Major John, JB Boswell joined us for the, for the interview. Uh, we've put a ton of information in the show notes. We've got PowerPoint slides. We've got links. You know, he's been gracious enough to be willing to be reached out to. So if you've got questions, he will answer them. I told him to expect a bunch of traffic. I know we're going to have a ton of questions about this one. And with good reason. What an amazing program. Yeah. And it's just a privilege to be part of an organization where this is even possible. Yeah. Who are we kidding, right? So again, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to Colin or I, and we can help put you in touch with JB. Awesome episode. Awesome program. And awesome Air Force. And awesome Air Force. Yeah. Just feeling good today. There we go. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Commission Ed.